Good evening, everybody. It is certainly a, a pleasure and an honor uh, to be here among real, real-time actors. Ning um, amjak say lalich all. I bring greetings and a depth of gratitude from my people, particularly the Maya women of Southern Belize, for creating a space for our voice. It wasn't long ago that the Maya women became visible within the Caribbean community. For some time now, um, I've recognized that as Maya people, we tried to fit in within Latin America and we didn't speak Spanish and therefore that was difficult. Uh, we tried to look to the Caribbean and um, we weren't of Carib descent and so that was difficult. Um, but I'm really happy that we have navigated those landscapes now and I'm really happy that there is a space for our voice. Before I go any further, I want to first thank the organizers of this symposium and the many partners who support this space of engagement. Thanks to the University of uh, the West Indies for making good on its commitment uh, to offer the highest form of intellectual development through dialogue with real-time actors of social change. That is all of you women who have been engaged in this symposium for the last two days. For the last day and a half, after an extremely delayed flight getting here, we had the gift of listening to women speak on a variety of issues, mostly as it relates to the struggle of injustices against women and against peoples confronting marginalization. At this meeting of women, in my language, the word for meeting is abink, literally translates to mean listen. I listened to my sisters speak, some with burning passion. Today, the meaning on the Maya calendar, the day on the Maya calendar is imosh. It means madness, passionate anger. It is the Nahual for water, seas, lakes, and rivers. The Nahual of rain and of water creatures. It is a good day to invoke rain a good day to ask for intelligence, to fight inappropriate things. This day can bring changeable human relations. So if a person is not careful, extreme character swings can occur. It is a good day for treating mental disorders. This is the day on the Maya calendar, Imosh. Isn't it incredible? I was very unsettled on what to title my talk tonight. I, I heard a lot of invocation of great names of great women who have led great struggles. And on the Maya calendar, because it is the day of the rivers and we're honoring the late and great Berta Caceres, It made me realize that we're each here for a purpose, and this might be what Ms. Cynthia called intentional purpose. We're here for an intentional purpose. I have listened to many women speak and I know that there's many of you here who have so much on your heart, so much burden that you carry. And I know that today is the day of passionate anger, 
We must be. What I will talk to you about is not something I did. It's something I am a part of. There's many before me that have done so much to contribute to the Maya struggle. And so I want to honor them as well. The many men, the many women, whose blood, sweat, and tears have created the conditions for the social change and the, uh, and the, the results are now proving true. And I am so honored to be a part of this place, this time in the Maya struggle. To give some context, I wanna show a short video that we created specifically to give the courts an understanding of what we were fighting for. This area, this general region, was known as the Mayan region. And even before the, the colonizers came to Belize and to Guatemala and began to name countries, Mayan people moved in this entire area. And when the borders became solidified, we started having Belizean Mayas. And this is evident in the remnants that are left behind. For instance, the Mayan temples. They're dispersed all over the Mayan region. As is evident in the Maya temples, Mayans lived here before 1492 and uh, lived here prior to the establishment of the state of Belize. There is a strong link between the ancient Mayas and our ancestors and, uh, and our present generation. They were farmers, they lived on the forest, they lived on the land. And what has, I think, has kept us together has been the, the ability of our, of our elders and uh, to, to communicate and disseminate uh, our knowledge system to, to, to generations. And a significant part of our cultural, spiritual um, um, relationship with the, the forest and the earth is pretty much tied to our spirituality. It's still practiced today. A Maya person's life can never be separated from the land because a land is an integral part of their very livelihood. Everything we do, everything we, um, we learn, everything we use comes from the land in one form or the other. Um, our very homes are built from the forest products that we gather. The, the cocoon leaves, the, the bay leaf, um, the sticks, the titai that we use for our homes, um, all of that is a gift from the forest. When we harvest the, the kuhun leaf, the kuhun palm, for touching our homes, we don't cut the tree down to, to get the leaf. We construct ladder, we go and cut the mature leaf only. That allows for that tree to regenerate back and uh, to be able to use again. The Mayan know how to manage and how to extract the resources from the forest without damaging, without um, denying future generation that opportunity. Our system of traditional milpa farming is one that is based on the principle of respect for humankind and respect for nature itself. Um, for instance, if you ask any Mayan person, a Mayan farmer, how do you decide how much land you put your milpa on? How do you decide how much acreage you use? He will say to you, well, you do what you can with the strength of a man. So whatever, you're, whatever you feel, as an individual, you can work. Then that is what you farm. You also realize what areas need to remain sacred, what areas are used as hunting grounds, what areas are used as fishing grounds. All of that within the context of thinking about your entire community. To understand the Mayan people's struggle, one has to, to go to the communities 
and see how community live, what they do for their living. To begin to appreciate the, the perspective and, and, and our request to the state and to the court. A lot of Mayan communities are situated around a, a watershed because that is their source of drinking water. That's where they go bathe, that's where they fish, that's where they do their dishes, that's where they wash their clothes. So everything that we do in our daily lives has a direct connection to the land. It is crucial to protect Maya village lands, partly because without the land, minus the land, Maya people cease to exist. As a farmer, Perfecto says he plants them um, cassava, yam, sweet potato, and cocoa, and pepper, not only with the corn. With his own uh, muscles, he has to work with every big trees in his um, slash and burn mill pot, and then he will plant. And then he, after the harvesting, he's going to leave that area for about eight years. And the reason why they have to wait for eight years is that um, they wait until the soil gets rich again, like how they use it the first time. It was very rich. The topsoil was very rich. We are at the house of um, Mr. Ihinio Tiul, who is a Mopan Mayan man, um, an elder of Santa Cruz village. He says, this is what we plant as Mayan people. This is bl the black beans that we plant, the red beans that we plant, um, the coffee beans that we have there. And these are root crops that we plant. It's called yampa. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That is the, the corn cob after you've shelled the corn off the cob. And they use it um, for the, the fire, to, to light the fire in the morning. Mm -hmm. He says, this, this, is, the, this is the rice that, that I um, plant and I sell it, he says. Um, and they also use it for food. While we eat a lot of what we grow, we also remember that we need it for next year. So we always have our seeds set aside that is going to be used to be planted again. So we're here in the kitchen of Miss um, Marcelina Tiul, and she's grinding her cacao, the cacao bean we use to make um, a drink that we call cacao. Mr. Ihinio is a bush doctor. And he says that his stepmother taught him how to identify different bush medicines. Um, he says, you know, and I cure all kinds of things. Um, for example, vomiting, diarrhea, fever. And he says, you know, all my children come to me when their children are sick or when they are sick. He says, you know, you find a lot of these medicinal plants out in um, the mountains. And he says, I've had to go out there and collect them and bring them back. Um, and he says, the beautiful medicine, uh, that was his, his word, the beautiful medicines are out in, in, in the mountains. What I'm trying to do is to build a nursery here to bring all my medicines closer. One of the things that we are trying to get the government and the court to understand is that our way of life is different from the rest of the Belizean people. The way we make our livelihood is different and that a policy of one fit all uh, cannot work for a multi-ethnic uh, multi plural society as Belize. The concept of lease land for Mayan people goes against our traditional ways of remaining communal and remaining united and respecting each other's use of the land. Maya people don't view themselves as owners of the land. They view themselves as stewards of the land. They view themselves as a part of Mother Nature herself. The Mayan community for a very long time have been trying to engage the state uh, to, to discuss issues that affect the lives and the well-being of the Maya communities. It seems that the state is unwilling to, to accommodate our way of life and hence the, 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 the Mayan people, which is land base, which is forest base, trying to get the courts to, to adjudicate and to, to ensure that those assets that define who we are and those assets that, that have formed part of our ecological knowledge, our culture, our spirituality, uh, remain intact. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons why we have engaged in this negotiation and, and 
with the government is, is to tell the government, look, the assistance you're giving us is, is not complementing our way of life. It's not securing a future for us. Rather, it is uprooting those structures and social fabric uh, that has bound us together, that has, de that has defined us as a people. We have come to realize that for many, many years, the land that we use and we occupy is insecure, has never been titled to us. It started off in 1995 when a multinational logging company came to the Columbia Forest Reserve. The communities did not realize that a company had been given concession to log in these forests until the bulldozers started coming into their communities. And that signaled a direct threat to them. This is where they go hunt. This is where they gather. This is where they get their medicinal herbs. And so they said, well, why, why is this happening? Why are we losing our forest? And why weren't we consulted? And then that is the time that a lot of people realize that, as a matter of fact, the government thinks of this land as land that the government owns. It is not for us. And that's when people began to say, Mayan people began to say, look, that is not right. We have lived in this area for centuries. We have protected and managed this area for centuries. And we continue to do so. If they are saying that this land is not ours, then we have nothing. And so that sparked the struggle to secure rights to their land. Ten years later, we are faced with more threats. And there's been a huge oil rush in the district of Toledo without consultation of the Mayan people. 1997 was when the first lawsuit was filed in the Supreme Court of Belize. That lawsuit went unheard. You know, it got filed, it stalled, nobody heard anything about it. And the leaders at that time then moved one step higher and said, we're going to file a petition to the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. The activities and actions of government by granting these logging concessions, by, by parceling land that belongs to the community and giving them to outsiders was in fact a violation of the rights of the indigenous people, the Mayan people in Toledo, based on the principles of the Inter-American Convention on the Rights and Duties of Man. The Commission found that uh, it, it was admissible, our case, and they started negotiations. The government of Belize were saying, you know, we want to go into friendly negotiations. We want to, to talk about this and find a political resolution for this conflict. Okay, okay. <laughs> Through these negotiations, they birthed what is called the 10 points of agreement between the government of Belize and the Mayas of Toledo. The most important point is point number six that says we respect and recognize that Maya people should have rights to their land, the land that they currently use. That was a beautiful agreement, but nothing has changed on the ground. The reality for Mayan people remain the same, that our land is insecure, and that day by day, land gets sold to foreign investors. Many of the Maya communities that we have been working with have been um, seventh generation. And in, in going to the communities, you see the, the degree of uncertainties um, resulting from not having anything to show uh, for what they have invested in. They have their homes, they have their, their families, they have their, their crops that they have invested in, and uh, it can be taken away um, by the stroke of a pen. We are yet to, to have our people begin to think of their future, uh, begin to dream, knowing that the investment they made, knowing that uh, what they want for the community is not going to be changed overnight because of government's policy. We are saying that we are tired of talking. We are tired of these friendly negotiations that are meaningless, that create no concrete changes on the ground. And so we are back in the Supreme Court of Belize. <laughs> and saying that because we have lived here for so long, because we continue to, to depend on the land, and because we are indigenous to this region, we deserve to be titled this land. And we are going to let the court decide this matter.
and we are hoping for a just resolution. Our way of life is, is dynamic and our interaction with our land and ecosystem is dynamic. It is our duty to ensure that we interact in a manner that does not undermine the integrity of that ecosystem. We should use the land. We need to use the resources, but use it to the extent that it will not deprive future generations. All these new threats now have made us realize that the land that we have occupied, that we call our very home, needs to be recognized within the laws of Belize, that it is titled to us, that it is for the Mayan people. And in whatever form they decide they want to use it, then that should be their right. It can't be the government telling us that our ways are backwards, that our ways are no good, that we're not modern enough. It can't be any third party telling us that this is how you are supposed to live. Well, Maya people know exactly how they're supposed to live. And they know that the way they live right now is peaceful, it's sustainable, and it makes them happy. We are asking to be respected as a people who have lived in these forests and have maintained and sustained the forest for centuries. And we are saying we want to continue to live as a Maya people. I showed that video to give some context to where the Maya people are, but that video could have well been made in Suriname, in Guyana, here in Trinidad. The stories are the same. Typically, our struggle is described as a struggle for indigenous rights. And it is true, we are struggling to have our rights as indigenous people recognized, including Importantly, our right to land. But this is not the only way to understand our struggle. All over the world, all throughout history, and we heard so much of it in the last day and a half, people have engaged in countless struggles for their dignity, for equality, for respectful and just societies, for democratic power relations, basically for a livable planet. We can draw the lines between these struggles as if the struggle were separate and belonged to distinct social groups. But the distinctions would be false. And we would only lose sight of something important, that our struggle is for a better world, one that is more just, and where there exists the possibility of many worlds, like the Zapatistas so eloquently say time and time again. In this sense, there, is on, there has only ever been one struggle. When I talk about our fight to secure recognition of our customary land tenure and respect for our way of life, I'm not talking about land at all. I'm talking about seeing a marginalized group of people as equal and as dignified, not as those people or the other, but as a part of this human race. We begin with land, and as you know, our struggle has long centered on land because that is where we find our identity. Today we heard so much about many different kinds of labels. And I came here today not wearing the label I was given. That label does not define me. That label tells what my name is. But today we heard so many times grappling with this notion of identity. Is it blood? 
Does a drop of blood define me? And who determined that that drop of blood defined me? In Maya Cosmovision, our identity is defined in this way. Two words, to belong. Where do I belong? It is not blood. It is a sense of belonging often tied to land. And I hear my Afro-descendant sisters grappling with that identity because we do have an identity crisis and it is a colonial construct that caused it. I'm neither here nor there because for 500 years we have been told that our identity is no good, that being indigenous, that being tribal, that being whatever the label is, is savage, it's backwards, it's no good. So we've lost our sense of belonging. In Maya Cosmovision, you belong to the land, you belong to Mother Earth, you belong to your community, and you belong to future generations. That sense of belonging is what has connected my people to this piece of land that we so passionately struggle for recognition of our rights on that land. So our struggle has not been about challenging the state in the courts, though we've used the courts. We've used the letter of the law, a tool of the colony, to affirm our rights. And here in Trinidad, the first time I came here, I saw a bus stop, and painted in the bus stop was graffiti, and the graffiti said, recognize, resist, revolt. Three words. Before you can reach the third word, you must recognize where you come from, who you are, who you belong to. And when you know who your identity is, when you recognize that there are oppressive societies that you live in, when you recognize that the oppression is in every facet of the systems that you live in, only then can you begin to resist. Only then will you know how to resist. I grew up like every other Echjimaya woman. My family didn't have much, but we had each other and we were happy. And as I grew up and I read about how they would write about us, they would always write about us as poor and illiterate, as weak. That is not my story. If you came to my community and you were hungry, you would be fed. If you came to my community, you would be sheltered. The recreation is free, we don't pay for it. An elder once told me, the land was here before you and I, and the land will be here after you and I. And one day, the land will consume us. Because no matter where you come from, we will return to that land. And so it's no surprise that all around the world, indigenous communities are asserting their right to their land, to where they belong. The Maya people took the law and we learned to navigate the legal systems. And I always joke and I always say, and I heard um, 
one of the speakers on the last panel today say, I'm not an academic. I will make a very similar disclaimer. I am not a lawyer. But I always joke and say, but I am a bush liar. Because we have learned to navigate the legal systems. And I will tell you, when we first went to the courts, we were not recognized. We were not respected. In 1996, when we filed the first case, it never went to a hearing. But we didn't give up. We went to the Inter-American Commission. We petitioned them. And they gave recommendations in our favor. And the government of Belize looked at us and laughed and said, well, those aren't enforceable in Belize. They are simply recommendations. But around that time, what they did not know was that there was a burning fire ignited. You heard Nilsia talk about it. You know what we call it? We call it the place where the umbilical cord joins the baby. And you don't have to be a mother to know that. It's the same place you were once joined to your mother. That's where that burning fire comes from. And that fire told us they had taken away someone that was so important to the Maya struggle from us. And you hear of all these massacres and all these painful atrocities just across the border in Guatemala. Well, in Belize, we lost someone very dear to this movement, the person who inspired my own action. And it was that burning passion. When we received the recommendations, we knew what the government's reaction would be. We've seen how they've been very dismissive. That's always been their reaction. But we decided that we would take that again and use it as leverage to go back to the courts of Belize. And in 2007, I will never forget, I was young. I had no clue that I would see the, the conclusion of these cases. And I heard the judge say, Judge Conte say, the Maya people will have their day in court. The embarrassment of the 90s will not repeat itself. And I knew from that first day that we were on the right path, that we were using the very tool that has often been used against us to affirm our rights. When we went to the courts, I will give you a summary because it's really boring and it takes a long time to go through courts and it took many years. We told that story that you saw. We had to show the judge what we were talking about. We had many testimonies of women and men, elders and healers before the courts. We sat for hours to listen to state lawyers call us squatters. When a settler society calls the original people squatters, you wonder what is happening up there. We are not squatters. Those forests are not empty. We are there. And in 2007, we received the first victory. And we thought, this is a precedent-setting victory. This is wonderful. Only to find that the government would limit the interpretation of that decision to say it only belonged to the two model communities that went before the courts. Now, what, what is a state saying to you when it says that? It says, if the other 36 communities want that same protection, they will have to come one at a time to court, knowing full well that while we are organized and united, we are cash poor, and lawsuits cost a lot of money. But we went back to the courts. 
Because in the time that the decision was given in 2007, to the time that we went back to court in 2008, in that very short span of time, they tripled the amount of logging concessions, oil development concessions on Maya people's lands. In fact, the reason we went back to court was because a developer bulldozed the land of our previous chief, in three days, he tore down the livelihood of this man. Mature cacao trees bulldozed. And why did he do that? He pulled a piece of paper and raised it and said, I have title. The government has given me title. Later, we found out that he had fueled the recent election campaigns. And so in exchange for that, they offered him our lands. We didn't have a piece of paper. And in the court, our elders said, you know, I don't have a signature of a minister to say that land belongs to me. But do you know where my signature is? All those trees that you see there, all the animals that you just disrupted, everything on that land is a signature that I inherited that from my ancestors. And so we went back to courts and we took a class suit for all the 39 or 36 remaining communities. And once again in 2010, the very same Chief Justice, Abdullahi Conte, said, this is deja vu. I've heard this case. But if I must state explicitly clear, and he named village by village. By this time, however, the government recognized, I think in 2007, when we first took the first case, again, we were seen as illiterate, incapable. You can barely speak English. And so they never had a clue how that we would be able to navigate this legal system. But by 2010, when the second decision came, the government stopped sending junior lawyers. <laughs> and they began to send senior counsels. And in 2010, when we received that decision, unlike 2007, they appealed that case to the courts of appeal. Now you had three judges sitting to hear this, this case, trying to see where the Chief Justice had erred where he had made a mistake, or if he had made a mistake. The Court of Appeals agreed with us and affirmed once again that Maya customary land tenure exists and where it exists, it constitutes property rights for the Maya people. And where that exists, the state has an obligation to protect to create mechanisms that would protect that right. In the Court of Appeals, they removed the protective order in the interim. And that for us we saw as very dangerous. So both sides appealed. We went to the Caribbean Court of Justice and we are here in Trinidad where that court sits. And you know, one of our leaders asked us when they heard that we were coming here. They said, but how will we get there? And they answered each other because I didn't have an answer for them. They said, well, if we have to swim, we have to paddle, we have to do whatever we can, we will get to Trinidad. Luckily, the court and the judges came to Belize and heard that case there. And thankfully, my people could sit in that court when we heard the Caribbean Court of Justice yet again affirm that Maya customary land rights exist based on their continuous use and occupation of their lands.
So I say that, not to say that the legal system is the only way to go, because it was not the only thing that we used. Today, I can stand before you and I can say to you, there is a court order, an affirmation of our rights, a recognition of my people. And the court even went further to say that the government must cease and desist from any further interference on our lands that might affect the use and enjoyment of those lands. Now that sounds like a success story, right? That sounds, I mean, it, it is. Regionally, it has set a, a, a great precedence. But I want to speak to you about the current struggle, where we are. The implementation is the real work. It is where the struggle begins. Today, I look at, I reflect upon the last, the decision of the CCJ was given in 2015, April of 2015. It is now April. Is it already April? It, Tomorrow, it's almost April of 2017. Two years later, we have only met with the government three times to discuss this implementation. And in those three times, we have not seen the political will to transform that court order into real and tangible changes for my people. And I will tell you something that maybe you've already heard and already known. The solution to our struggles will not be found in the courts. It will not be found with the government, because there's two kinds of people in this world. And I don't mean men and women. I mean the oppressed and the oppressor. And the oppressor knows nothing else but to oppress. My friend put it to me like this. A dog will be a dog. A dog does not know to be anything else but a dog. So don't try to change that dog. Instead, change from within. Transform your reality. We must be the example for our own liberation. And I want to offer to you tonight how the Maya people are doing that. We're not waiting for the government of Belize who for generations have denied us our right. We're not waiting for them to implement this right. We did not go to the courts to prove to ourselves that we own those lands. We went to the courts to prove to the rest of the world that we belong to those lands. That's where our identity is. And so now that we're looking at implementing an order, we begin by ensuring that we guard our unity as a people, that we begin to look at the land from a different lens. And we're engaged in some very exciting times. I'll tell you why. For many years, our land was seen as the last frontier to conquer. And this time, not by Christopher Columbus, not by the British colony, but by the state of Belize. And we ask ourselves, why do they want to come onto our lands? What is on our lands? Why can't we do that ourselves? Whether they're coming for the oil, whether they're coming for the gold, whether they're coming for the logs, why can't we 
take those resources and transform them for ourselves, for our own development. We've embarked now on a process we're calling Rebuilding Maya Communities, Building a Maya Economy. And by that I don't mean in the capitalistic sense. We can resist capitalism. But we must understand it in order to transform it to be what we need it to be. And what we have decided to do then is to begin to define for ourselves our future. Where do we want to go? We have land rights, now what? Now the court, I mean the government might never come around to giving the title as is being ordered. However, we need to begin to define that space, both in the physical sense and in the sense that we define what that space is going to create for us, for our people. I don't know if you saw in the video the thatch roof house that was being built. A lot of times you see that as poor people's house. Even ourselves, sometimes we see that. We want the concrete house, we want the hurricane shelters, we want the glass windows. And that is great, that is good to have. You deserve to have that. But it should not define who you are. And so today, we ask our people, are we poor? Are we without shelter? Don't we know anything? And over the last three days, I heard you say, we have traditional forms of knowledge, which are scientific, as scientific as they get. We have that knowledge, that culture, that intangible culture that we heard about. How can we take that to change the power relations that we find ourselves in? And I proposed this to our elders. I said, you know, if you look around Belize, in Belize, everything is Maya. Maya this, Maya that, even the bear is Maya. There's a Maya temple on it. Now I heard they changed it. Um, but we are used as objects. We're sold. In the biggest industry in Belize is ecotourism, tourism. So I told my people, you know, how about considering yourself Mayan engineers? Every eco-resort wants to build cabanas. Whose knowledge is that? Where does that come from? Where is the material sourced from? It's sourced from our lands. It's our knowledge that's working there. But we've never been able to change our identity and see ourselves as engineers, as scientists, as, as holders of knowledge. And until we can do that, and it starts with this recognizing where you come from, a reflection of where you are. And when you do that, and when you can see yourself from a place of power, you can transform your reality. And what the Maya people are doing now is to say, that land belongs to us. We will begin to chart a road map that will create a viable, sustainable Maya economy. Because states respond to two things. They respond to people by way of votes, and they respond to money. And one of these days, the Maya people from the Maya lands in southern Belize will be able to say, we have rebuilt the economy of the nation state of Belize. We've contributed to that. And we've done that from our lands. And right now, when you say that in the Maya communities, some of us wonder, and we fear and we laugh. When we first said we were taking the government to court, we had that same reaction. But don't fear what you can challenge. 
Because if you find that burning passion to make a change, it has to come from you. Don't wait on someone else to come and do it for you. It's never gonna happen. I listen in the last day and a half to us talking about identity, to us talking about sovereignty, to us talking about aut autonomy. And my people have lived through that. One thing I did not hear about was discrimination and racism. And it is a real thing. And I never used to think about it, not in that sense. But recently, and I will tell you now a very personal story. Recently, I recognized what that was. I saw it so openly. I was in a community meeting, listening. The community was making a decision on a trespass on their lands. We went to the state and we asked for help. Come help us. A gentleman had settled on a Maya temple, had bulldozed a road to the top of the temple and had constructed a house up there. The community members went to him many times, the leaders went to try to say, there's a process for coming into our communities. There are rules, there are customary laws that exist. It's not written, but it exists. And he did not listen. Instead, he pointed a gun at them. And for several months, we tried to engage the institutions that are supposed to protect us. And they failed to protect us. And at the end of the day, the community decided to make a decision, a collective decision, because the fundamental place for decision making is the meeting. And so they were deciding on an eviction. This gentleman walks in and basically threatens that he can take down up to 100 people. And now I speak of this publicly because it became a court, court action. And now I'm free to speak about it publicly. And I think it's important. That case was a case of a violation and infraction on Maya people's land. And it had nothing to do with that individual. It had to do with the lack of state protection for our rights because they continue to be dismissive of our rights. And so the community, we have our own traditional forms of governance. The police didn't show up. Nobody came to our aid. The community, by way of their traditional leader, the alcalde, ordered an arrest. And he has the authority to do so by his community, by way of customary law, but also under the very laws of Belize, he has the jurisdiction to arrest and to act as a local magistrate. This gentleman was arrested. As a community organizer, you navigate a very delicate space. Because I was sitting right there, I was witnessing what was happening. And it did not occur to me, ever, that he was an agent of the state. Until he spoke to me and he said, I am not here by accident. I could have built my house anywhere in this village, but you wouldn't have come. And so you must recognize that even in victories, there will always be the targeting of your systems of governance, of your leadership. And one of the things we recognized three days after this man had been uh, arrested uh, for a couple hours and then released because he agreed to remove the structure. Three days later, in the darkness of night, 
truckloads of police officers, riot squads, people of, that would take down militant groups, rained down on our community, this small little village in Santa Cruz, and pulled people out of their beds and arrested them. And I went to see them. I went very early to the police station, as I had heard. We had gotten a call. Only to find that I, too, <laughs> got arrested. And I will tell you something. That at that point, I had learned that what they were arresting me for, what they wanted to arrest me for, was conspiracy to create this revolt that I talked to you about. I was sitting at that meeting, I never said one word. Even while he spoke, I never said one word. But in the end, they charged us for false imprisonment and had to drop that charge later because it doesn't exist. And later they charged us for common assault and some of us for aggravated assault. For one year, our lives were put on hold. And I could not speak, even though I was the spokesperson. Because anything I said would be used against me. And I recognized in that event a series of events. The case was dropped, so I, I, I am free. But for that whole year, this gentleman basically told the world that the reason he was being removed from our village was because he was black. And we did not want black people in our village. And you know what that did? That stirred a division Amon, the black people, and the Maya people. And that was the first time that I saw the state use that as a weapon against two groups of marginalized people. It's incredible. It's the oldest tool that they have used to divide and conquer, and they used it so appropriately at that time. And I remember the hardest part for me was the following day. Because the day I was arrested was the day my daughter was graduating from preschool. And how do you explain this to a four-year-old? How do you explain all the people filled in your house watching the evening news and watching her mother handcuffed. You know what she said? And, and, and I really think that children know more than, than we think they do. She said, Mom, it's OK. What's important is that you're safe. The following day, the following day, to make it up to her, I went to her school all day with her because it was the party. It was the end of school. And what I saw there is what breaks the spirit that we try to maintain as leaders. When I went to her school, I saw the parents of children we had spent time with for the whole year, I saw the parents try to keep their children from playing with my daughter. And many of these people were women. And that was hard to watch because there is an underlying racism that exists among us and we must confront it and we must deal with it and we must talk about it. Because the state uses it against us. 
When we talk about feminism, we're talking about division between men and women in many sense. When we talk about solidarity and standing with people of op oppressive societies, we must talk about it in the truest sense. Because if we say we fight for inequality, but then turn around and be dismissive of a people's struggle, be dismissive of the institutions and the policies that continue to discriminate against us, then we're not talking about equality. If we say we champion equality and we, and we emphasize that, but we distance ourselves from talking about the freedom of a woman to love another woman, to choose a life partner that is different from what we know, then we're not talking about championing equality. And I say that because as a community leader, everything I say is measured. If I even speak in solidarity with a different group of people, I am labeled. And the labels are many. But if we are to be truly standing in solidarity and fighting for a more just world, then the oppression of one cannot be more important than the oppression of the other. And that is why I am saying here and now that our struggle as a Maya people could be the struggle of Guyana, could be the struggle of Suriname, could be your struggle. And the struggle of women, indigenous women in particular, is so important because a lot of times we operate within a system that does not give us the space or the time to really be recognized for the contributions that we make. And I'm so happy to tell you today that As a Kekchi Maya woman who was raised in a home with mostly girls, I've always had a rebellious spirit. And I don't really know that it was influenced one way or the other from my parents. But what I can tell you is that the recognition of being oppressed the recognition of being discriminated against, the recognition of my own identity was the beginning of this roadmap to the resistance. And we must resist. We must resist every forms of oppression. And when you resist, it leads to that space and time that revolutionary time, that revolt. And when that revolt comes, that's the time that transformation happens. And I'm looking forward to that revolt, and I'm looking forward to having you with me in that revolt, because the Maya struggle is your struggle. And I want to offer, as a, as, a, as a conclusion, that a lot of times as women, we only celebrate each other after we're gone. And so today, in this space and in this time, I look around this room and I wonder, how could I have come across and crossed paths with many women in this room some at the Inter-American Commission Human Rights, some in Belize, some all over the world. Faye and I met in, in, in Paris at the Equator Prize. And all of you 
have inspired me to continue on this path. And we have to learn to inspire each other, to encourage each other, to lift up in each other. Because our men are oppressed, we often mimic our oppressors, right? And so they won't lift us up. But we cannot wait, just as the Maya will not wait for the government to implement. We cannot wait for the men to recognize us. We need to recognize each other, here and now. And we need to begin to do that by embracing true solidarity. Somebody said it today, and I think it was Miss Ellis, she said, and I always look to my elders because they're so wise in the way they say things. We must be available for each other. And so I want to say that to all of you who I've met here, who I've heard from, I am available. If you want to learn about how to navigate the legal systems, like I said, I'm not a lawyer, but I'm available. If you want to learn how to advocate the United Nations systems, the answer is not there either, but I will teach you how to do that. If you want to learn how to organize in your community and how to ensure that women become a part of the leadership, I can teach you that too. I am young, but I understand what it meant to stand in front of a room of 200 men. <laughs> Mayan men are not easy to talk to. I had to fight for this space to lead. But I can tell you something. That you will reach a place where you understand who you are. None of those things will become personal anymore. You will transform beyond that. And you'll be able to see people and take them for who they are. Many times I have heard and many times I have seen women cry. We don't cry from a place of weakness. We cry from a place of power because we're realizing, we're realizing where we are. And after the tears, <laughs> there comes the revolt. There comes the revolt. And so I'm so excited to be here because I can tell you, I see so much that we can give to each other. And I know that the real Change comes when we return home, when we can call each other. I know Audrey has already told me many times, I need your net networks, and I offer that. Because if we can move Suriname and set a precedence there, and we can move Belize and set a precedence there, and we can move uh, Guyana, then my friends, we are in the revolution. We are in the revolt. And I will end by saying this. There was a visionary uh, at the Bakhtun 13, which was uh, December 21st, 2012. Um, was it 12? Yeah. That was the day that everybody said the world would end. <laughs> well, not the Maya people. We knew what that day meant. And at the celebration at Tikal, one of our Mayan sites in Guatemala, there was a vision from one of the spiritual guides and they said, you know, this is the time when indigenous uprising is going to transform this unjust world that we find ourselves in. <laughs> but more importantly, he said something that caught my attention that this is the time that our women will rise up and that our women will take their place to lead. Before I came to this conference, I asked, is it only going to be women? 
And I was told, it appears so. <laughs> and so I am speaking to you, not as an academic, because that's not the language we speak. But I'm speaking to you as my sisters. And I can see that burning passion, and I can see that transformation, and I hope that I can live to see what we produce. Because at the end of the day, Indigenous people talk about their struggle as Mother Earth. And we are the mothers here on this earth that are going to transform our realities. Thank you. Both humble and inspired. Please let us just show our appreciation for Ms. Christine. I feel like all we can do at this point is just breathe. <laughs> um, we now have a performance by Chantal Estelle and Stacy Sobers, who have come to grace us with their music and their song. Um, and then we will move to our thanks.